Kato Kato Kato, hello and welcome to this edition of Sky Sports Playmakers. This is where we get an opportunity to sit down and have a chat with someone who's been in and around the game, a character, a legend, and I'm really excited about tonight's episode because this is about a family. This is about four brothers that had a great career. They played together, some are still playing, and some have come back to New Zealand and forged their own paths and done it all. And, and it's a pleasure to welcome onto this edition it's Adam Whitelock. Adam, thanks very much. Let's talk rugby DNA because pure and simply, when there's four of you and you're all outstanding and you all played together and played different positions, where did that DNA come from in the Whitelock family? Yeah, g'day, Jeff. Uh, thanks for having me along. Where did that DNA come from? Mum's dad was an all black in 1953, 1954. I believe he played 25 games for the All Blacks and five test matches. Um, my dad played for Manor 2 and represented the New Zealand Colts. Mum's uncle was an All Black in 1953, 1954 as well, Alan Elsom. And Mum's uncle was an All Black, Graham Higginson. So, yeah, we, we've got a lot of rugby history in the family. So, I guess naturally, um, growing up, we wanted to... Uh, follow in those footsteps and, and play rugby like most uh, young Kiwis. Look, uh, born and bred on the farm, just outside of Palmerston North in the Manawatu. And when I look at this, uh, and you've got George, Luke and Sam, there's, there's four of you, and there's not too many years between you. I mean, when you're growing up, was it the typical, you're on the farm, posts out the back, were you watching rugby, playing rugby? Is that just the way your childhood played out? Yeah, we were really lucky and fortunate to have an upbringing on a dairy farm. Um, naturally, you're outside and you're playing playing rugby on the back lawn. We played a lot of um, knee rugby on the tramp. N normally, it would be Samuel and I versus George and Luke, because George and Luke were the oldest and the youngest, and Sam and I were the middle two. So naturally, it, it ended up being quite an even game. And we would always play until we were called in for dinner or until someone started crying, normally Luke, because he was the youngest. But... Yep. Um, yeah, we were always uh, out there just throwing the ball around. Um, if it wasn't that, we were probably out possum hunting, um, building huts out down by the river or making uh, in the hay shed with our spotlights and torches climbing through tunnels. So um, it was an awesome upbringing, um, which we're very, really appreciative of. Can you, can you run me through the rules of knee rugby on the tramp? I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it's an old style tramp, was it? You know, one of the round ones with uh, no sides on it. I mean, how does how does that work? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no sides on it. The springs, um, quite often you'd, a limb or two would be hanging down through the springs and, and you're obviously only allowed on your knees and it was just full on, more of a probably a wrestle than a, than a game of rugby because it's just a small surface area and, uh, and uh, it would just be a big pile of all four of us just sort of wrestling for the ball and, and trying to get the ball to the other end. So... You used to play that for hours, and that was a lot of fun. And so, I mean, all of you were physical players. Do you think that's where it started? I mean, we talk about the game now, and, and there's so many hybrid forms, particularly for kids growing up. But pure and simply, was it if you were old enough, it was time to tackle? Yeah, definitely. Um, we were always tackling each other on the back lawn. And, you know, you grow up, we were playing bare feet on a frosty Saturday morning. I think George was six, I was five, and Sam Sam was still three and a half, and he joined in. Um, and those at that age, we were still playing touch, but it just showed. Um, yeah, Samuel was uh, wasn't even at, at school, and he he came in and joined in there. Luke would have been um, probably uh, two two years old or something. But yeah, I think um, all those sort of physical because you're sort of playing with each other and wrestling, and that's where that sort of physical. Um, background comes from because you're growing up with uh four, four of us so like me having three brothers so you're always sort of learning how to um fend for yourself and you take a few knocks along the way and and that um i guess just builds a bit of character and and helps you uh, grow up have all four of you got distinctive personalities yeah um you probably have to ask our wives or, or mum might give you the best answer there jeff but i think yeah. uh like there's only five years between 
George and Luke, so the oldest and the youngest. Now we're all our own men. Um, we've all got our, our own own person, but you probably ask a lot of our friends, and, and a lot of a lot of them will probably say we've got many traits in common, just because we're so close in age and we, we grew up together. So we've played a lot of rugby together. Um, but yeah, it's uh, George. He's probably or well, he's the oldest, so he's probably the natural leader, the captain. Um, you know, might be the grumpy captain at, at times. Um, he's uh, he's probably the best hunter, though. Um, done a lot of hunting and, and quite practical. Um, George is back on the farm now. Myself, um, yeah, the second child. Uh, probably, you know, follow George around. Lucky to have an older brother. Um, was always sort of uh, into, into fitness and running and, and pretty active. I was probably a bit of a nerd at school. I worked hard and, and liked to uh, try and get really good grades, which uh, I was like, I succeeded at school and then went down to Canterbury and got a, an accounting degree, which was uh, really awesome. And Samuel the third, well, mum always said he was meant to be the girl. Um, he was going to be called Samantha. <laughs> he came out uh, with uh, really long eyelashes and um, and mum says, you know, a lot of girls would die for those those length of eyelashes. But <laughs> Sam was... Uh, Sam was uh, really tall and quite a beanpole, and he played a lot of basketball at school. And I think from all those, he used to play basketball on a Friday night and then rugby on a Saturday. And I think, you know, all those skills he learned from basketball was carried through to serve him well in his rugby career, catching the line-out ball above his head, little pop passes. That just sort of formed a really good base for Samuel's skill set now. Um, and uh, and Luke, he's the baby. Um he uh, he eats the most, um, probably the most spoiled. But he'll he'll probably tell you that mum and dad had to try four times for the perfect child. So yeah, <laughs> so I don't know if that if that helps. But uh, yeah, we're all different, but but some are at the same time. Yeah, I love that because, like you say, you are all different. Um, but if you look at the way that you played the game, it just there there was a lot of similarities. But let's talk about the competitive amongst you was the fact were you all as competitive as each other or did 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 someone throw the toys more could someone handle the adversity a little bit better or could someone walk away um in that regard yeah it's a it's a good question um i think you know george and i being the oldest we sort of might have forged the way a bit and then and then samuel and especially luke have you know, seeing your older brothers go through certain things can can live and learn off those experiences. Um, yeah, so we we all sort of have had a lot of success and a lot of support along the way, but at the same time, we've had some um, you know downs that go with the ups. So it's just about once you're through those downs, you sort of look back and you reflect, and you do get a lot of learning out of them, um, and you can tell those stories to your brothers, which they all sort of get learnings out of them as well. For example, bad injuries. You know, no one likes getting injured, but sometimes you just, we know it's a physical game, you get a bad injury, so you might have to miss most of a campaign or sometimes the whole campaign. Um, and if you see your brother get injured or you can probably, um, you just know what the other side looks like. So, um, yeah, in terms of the competitiveness, we, we all, all growing up together, we, we were certainly competitive. For example, if we went for a run, after school like if one brother ran five kilometers and back for example to the old bus stop and back um the next brother might might go out and, and run to the old bus stop and another 500 meters up the road um yeah and then the next brother after that might might go and do another k up the road um so we sort of had that the 3k run the 5k run and the 10k run around which is normally around the farm or the roads around the farm so and in saying that, we would um, we'd quite often go together um, and, and go at a good pace. But it was always uh, that last 200 metres, no, <laughs> sort of no, nothing was said, but it was just an all-out sprint from uh, the, our old house. We were brought up to our new house that mum and dad built. So it was from that letterbox to the letterbox, which was about 200 metres, but it was um, hammer down and, and see at the finish line sort of thing. Did anyone go early? I'm always interested in this, you know, like the fact that there was there a bit of a, you know, are we talking the Olympics here, the last 200 of a, of a 10,000, you know, or the 5,000, you're going, right, are we waiting for someone to go? <laughs> no, um, I think we all, we, once we, we 
we may, might have got a bit of anticipation and, and a bit of a faster rolling start, but um, <laughs> it was pretty clear if you went early. Um, but like, you know, I think we were all uh, reasonably fit, but we probably weren't the fastest rugby players out there. But um, so, but uh, maybe at the end of a long run, we still had a had a bit of bit in the tank. So um, you just had to leave it all out there. All right, who had the most friction? Between the, for the four of you, you know, where did the most friction happen? Because there's always friction. I only had one brother, an older brother, so there was just friction between the two of us. But surely, <laughs> somewhere between, was it youngest and oldest? How did it work? Oh, yeah, I'm going to have to single one out. Is that what you're asking, Jeff? Absolutely. <laughs> you got to uh, stick together like flies on a ship, Jeff. I can't single anyone out. <laughs> oh, come on now. Come on now, there's always one, you know, there's oh, always one. Oh, you got the oldest, don't you? Like I said, you know, yeah. George, he might be the, the oldest, the grumpiest. Um, so trying to trying to boss us around, we, we might say, you're not the captain back here, George. So, yeah, if I single one out, it might might be George. <laughs> okay, so did you know sport without your brothers? I mean, you're talking um, uh, schoolboy rugby, you're talking high school rugby. Did Did you know other sports or was it always with them? Yeah, I um, personally got into a lot of athletics. Um, that came off the back of when I went to when I went to high school. I wanted to get really fit to play rugby, and, and in the boarding house, you had to get up and go for a run at six in the morning every hour of the morning, and actually get quite fit for that. And then leads into athletic season. So, so I um, had a bit of success there through um, doing athletics. Samuel, um, and sorry, that, that sort of, forward, for, I believe, formed the base of my rugby career just sort of by working hard and having that really good fitness base because um, the world, the, the team always needs hard workers and might not have been the fastest on the team or had the most skill or the biggest sidestep, but I think getting really fit in the off-season just helped me in-season to play 80 minutes and play 80 minutes at intensity and work really hard and get into support lines. Um yeah, George was, all of us did athletics. Um, Samuel, like I said, did a lot of basketball. Luke played a lot of basketball. Um, they had a really good coach at high school. Um, and I think a lot of skill came off the back of that. Um, yeah, I think other sports of hunting, we, we've always sort of been out in the hills hunting. So that sort of, once again, forms a bit of a base as you grow up. Um, also a bit of resilience and toughness when you're walking around the hill a pig on your back, um, you know, you, they sort of training you can't quite get in the gym. Don't get me wrong. You've got to do all the Pacific gym training stuff, but walking around the hill, uh, wind and rain in your face and, and um, walking through Madagari and Gorse, it's, um, it just sort of gives you a base to um, draw back on maybe when you're playing in later years to know that you've been in some tough situations before. What was your, what was the signature event in athletics? Oh, Yours. yeah. Like, uh, I, I used to run... I, I held the the high school eight hundred meter record um, at Fielding High School. Ouch! That's a tough. That's a tough distance, right? That's. I mean, is that, is that? I mean, is that putting people in the hurt locker? Is that what you're talking about there? Where it's not so much about speed; it's pure ability to grind it out. Yeah, I think so. Um, eight hundred meters and lactic acid sort of event. Um, it's not a run. It's not a sprint. Well, it kind of is a sprint for two laps, really. Um, yeah, but. Yeah, and you're pretty buggered after the end of it. I think the 800 and 400 are tough events. You mentioned boarding school, going to the boarding house. You only lived 30 minutes from the school. I mean, what was the? I mean, was it the fact that they were that they were that keen to get you a little bit further away? How did how did that play out? I mean, was that was that something that certainly maybe changed? Uh, I, I suppose your your social aspect of of your life, and particularly the ability to, to interact differently with other kids. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, being four boys and no sisters, um, I think mum and dad thought it was a good idea for us to go to boarding school. I think they always tell everyone there, they sent us to boarding school because it would save on the grocery bill because mum used to yeah. go to the supermarket with two trolleys um, and trying to get the groceries with four little kids hanging off her was a bit of a mission. So they sent us to boarding school Um but on reflecting on our years at boarding school, because we were so involved in sport, you'd finish school and you'd just be right there for training. Um, our hostel manager, Rick Francis, was a big influence on, on us. He was the first 15 coach as well. Um, and yeah, we, we made a lot of good friends at boarding school that we've sort of kept for life. A lot of other rural kids so we could relate to that came from around the area. Um, 
and and it taught us some really good disciplines like just getting up early you know getting getting up and getting organized you know getting up going for a run come back and vacuum your dorm or sweep the paths this is really basic things but it sets you up for life and doing prep like you know the discipline each night to do an hour or two of prep was uh, pretty important just uh for me that's what i did to doing well at school to lead on to go to university okay so that you, you're talking about high school here and you and i suppose every level that you're going through was this really the first opportunity that you got for for everyone to play together just for a brief moment yes um and the borders day boy match that happens every year after the season the hostel boys were there's about 130 hostel boys and maybe 50 girls would play the the school team there's about a hundred a thousand um kids that uh that were day students so george was in his last year and luke was third form and so george samuel and i all started and luke being the the youngest he came on the end i think he just played on the wing that was the first game we all played together jeff back at high school yes yeah which is i mean i mean i look at that and i think to myself do you, i mean do you do you think about all that time before you before everyone starts leaving do you look back at that growing up and and even appreciate it even more now that you you had the opportunity to do all of that yeah 100 percent. really appreciate the opportunity to to play with your brothers is, is pretty special like through high school in canterbury and in the crusaders um and obviously samuel and luke have played together in the all blacks it yeah it's it's, it's awesome maybe at the time you don't quite realize how cool it is until yeah. I've finished, like when I reflect on it or you ask me that question, you, you sort of pinch yourself and it was pretty unreal. Okay. All right. So you get to that point. Uh, just before we move on, so we've got a lock, two loose forwards and a midfield back. Was it always that way? Or is it purely that you were the fastest you, you, of the of the four? that was why you ended up out there or did you slowly end up out there yeah um so dad was a lock he's a meter 96 and w would have been a, a big lock um you know 30 40 years ago um yeah. when when we all started playing rugby we actually all george myself and luke played in the backs and samuel always played in the forwards now george and luke went into the forwards when they got to high school so about 13 years old and I actually went into the Fords um, for a season. I played a bit of open side flanker. And then I think at fourth or fifth form, I went back into the backs. I think dad, you know, that mum and dad, when we were, before we got to high school, just sort of let us play and supported us, didn't overcoach us or anything. Um, but I did know, I think dad recognised us playing in the backs early would help develop our skill set even more, which I, I think was a good move. Now, not sure if it helped helped me um, too much, Jeff, but I know it probably it probably helped the others um, playing in the backs and then going into the forwards because you know now being a forward, well forwards props pass like backs used to, um, you know props uh, have got to be multi skilled now. So um, yeah, so those three are in the forwards, and I stayed in. I was only the smartest one to stay in the backs. Um, perhaps on the the best good the most uh, good looking, but. Uh, <laughs> I get a bit of ribbing from them um, that I'm the only back, uh, but uh, yeah, they gang up on me. But I just sort of give it back to them. Mate, don't 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 take any of that. Bottom line, you're out there because you're capable enough to do it. They were in there because they knew they'd lost something, and that's why speed is everything. Speed is everything. That's what I say anyway. Yeah, um, well, you can relate uh, to that. You, mentioned, you mentioned that. You mentioned Braden. I mean, what what influence did he have? How much? I mean, how were the discussions post games? I'm always fascinated. I had great discussions yeah. with my dad about the yes. games that I played and he saw me play. What were those discussions like when you're sitting around the table and someone's played that day? And, and were you all listening intently or was it, oh, here we go again? <laughs> this, is, this is, it's coming at us. <laughs> yeah. No, dad, dad and mum were very um, influential in our careers and in making who we are today. So throughout the week, dad would, would touch base and, and would normally just have a wee chat around how the week's going but certainly after the game we would 
quite often mum and dad would be at the game so we would uh um we would always catch up and ask them how we went how they thought we went um normally the day after we might all go get brunch together or have breakfast um certainly dad would take a very keen interest given his um four sons were playing but yeah. dad being a Fords coach coach us at school or coach yeah, coached the first 15 at school, he did the forwards. So he naturally probably had a bit more to do with George, Luke and Sam being forwards. Um, and, and I was a back. So, um, yeah, Dad Dad was always trying to keep up with the latest of how rugby was played. And um, Dad was a successful coach in his own right and coached Hurricane Schools and Man or Two teams in our first 15 and was a New Zealand school selector. So Dad was always sort of kept up with the modern way the game was played and and you you put that with his his rugby playing experience it was quite good to to ask dad his, his opinion um but more so for my other brothers because they were forwards and dad had a lot of knowledge around the line out and set piece things like that uh, but dad was smart enough to probably bring in a lot of resource coaches at, when we were at school especially that knew a lot about backs play so he would um keep up with those those facets of play so he prepared you well then for what was going to be the next step. And the next step for all of you, George went down to Dunedin um, for a little while, um, for Ota uh, down to Otago, but going down to Christchurch. Now, there was definitely a family connection, not, not to stay in the Manawatu, but to head down to Christchurch. Was that part of the driving force behind this, the, the, the part around your mum's side of the family? Yes, um, for me, it, it really was. I wanted to go to university, so I thought Otago or Canterbury. When I was a young kid, I had a Crusaders jersey um, when I was maybe six or seven, something like this. And we used to come down every other summer to visit mum's um, family um, and her brothers and sisters and and her mum and mum's parents when they were still alive. Um, so. We, George and I came down with Dad and we met Matt Sexton and Matt was great to myself and my brothers and Matt showed us around Christchurch and the academy. Um, then when I went home, I was like, yeah, that's awesome. Um, I want to go to Canterbury. There was an opportunity to go to the halls and, and I started accounting. And then I was the first to come down here. Now that first year away from home, even though I was at boarding school, you know, um, it was my first year away from home. So I drove down. Uh, caught the ferry, got down, yeah. um, went into the halls, studied seven papers that year, and I got a spot in the Canterbury Academy. And I remember my first day, I just, I was all ready, my socks were up and had my bag and my mouth guard was all prepared, like Dad taught us, you know, clean boots. Yeah. And, you know, um, so, and I went in to, to Rugby Park and Chris Jack was the current All Black and playing for the Crusaders at that time. And he came in and I didn't have a door pass or a swipe key and he just let me in the door and I thought, wow, like, you know, here I am rubbing shoulders with a current All Black. Um, you know, my first year out of school, I'm going in to do a weight session with the academy and, um, you know, you've got Crusaders and um, sort of rubbing shoulders with you, might be in the physio room or doing their own training outside. Um, I had a really, it was a really tough year in terms of it was busy, um, but a really enjoyable year. And then after, because I had, we won the Colts. I played for high school old boys and we won the Colts final, um, which was which was a great team and had a really fun year. So then George came up the following year from Otago. There was an opportunity to come up and be part of the Crusaders squad. And then George, George came up and he played for high school old boys as well and for the Crusaders. And then a year or two later, Samuel came down and then Luke came down. But Samuel and Luke played. I think they play, were playing New Zealand schools and then maybe New Zealand under 19. So they, their first year out of school, they played in those that New Zealand under 19s campaign. And then they sort of had a bit of time off with a gap year or did a few other things and then, and then came down. So yeah, I, I guess I forged the way down to Canterbury um, and George very soon after me, after having two years in Otago and, and he had a great experience down there. Then having George and I here, Samuel came down and Luke came down, but you know, we had a lot of support here, whether it was Matt Sexton or Robbie Deans or lots of lots of other people. Um, but Dad was sort of very helpful to fly down with us to be around the, those conversations. So 
he could because the first person we would ring whether it was signing a new contract or getting some advice would be mum and dad of course we of course. had warren alcock who was at the agent for all of us but we would ring warren and we'd ring a few other people that we trusted but certainly mum and dad were very influential um and just helping us transition out of school and eventually down here to canterbury which in my opinion was the best move for my rugby career because of the best training and the, the best systems the best coaching um and, and it was very good to me you know the rest of new zealand's rolling their eyes going here we go you know this is just this is the canterbury juggernaut you know this is what they do i mean what makes it so special why does it continue to do what it has done for so many years in terms of producing high quality you know not just provincial but super rugby and international players from your perspective what possibly sets it apart because you know you've played overseas but this is unique to new zealand right yes a lot of people ask me that question um i think all things being equal of course you need good coaching you need a good weights program you need you need all those things but i think that it's that word culture um that it probably gets thrown around a lot but it but it really is probably that might separate canterbury or crusaders or this region potentially to other clubs around the world or or in new zealand um that's no disrespect to other teams because i know a lot of them are really good now and, and and everyone goes through different cycles but if you look at the la the history of canterbury and especially in the crusaders um there's a lot of history there they've had some awesome talent awesome players awesome coaches but it's probably that culture and now to me that culture what is what does that look like i think you actually have to live the culture so it's like every day it's the way you greet your your playmakers whether it's a fist pump or a shake of the hands just looking each other in the eye really simple things but you you keep connected with each other it's connecting with the players and their families um, so they feel part of it it's having really good um team themes around what you want to achieve for that year uh, that are more than just words up on the changing room walls they might be pictures they're reinforced by videos you've got themes that out of that we can all pull analogies and talk a common language um so but you have to work on it every day every week um for it to become sort of part of your routine part of the team's routine so having songs written and sung um like lots of sort of barbecues um we have a lot of fun as well yeah. you know in the in the team but at the same time you know you have to switch on and, and nail your job nail the, the key trainings nail your gym sessions as well but I'm, I'm i guess i'm just trying to look for something that potentially canterbury and the crusaders do that maybe other teams don't um so it, it's that sort of that that culture and, and caring for each other um because we all know like when the push comes to the shove the better you know your mate or the tighter you are if you're on defense and you're under the pump you're going to just do that a little bit extra the tighter you are as a group as opposed to um you know going to training and not really knowing the boys that well when when the push comes to the shove you know are you going to step up for your mate the conversations i've had with a lot of people and you mentioned it straight away that very first year it's it's chris jack that swipes you in and lets you into the gym and, and the conversations i've had with people is the fact that through the different generations of players there's that still that initial contact that, that it's almost like you understand the standard is met because you've seen chris jack in the gym and you've seen how the things are done at the highest level would, would that be true for you the fact that you're always aware it as you were coming through you saw enough of it you trained with them enough to know okay that's where i want to get to would that be fair yeah i think that's fair jeff like because when throughout your career you're trying to help that the younger guy come on as well and 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 tell him what standards he needs to live to but also show them and that could be me doing the dishes if i'm a senior player at canterbury and the canterbury team you know stepping up and picking up all the gear because that they help create a heartbeat or a culture um and then so they're going to naturally pass that on hopefully to to the when they're a senior player to those next younger players so uh, one of, i read a quote todd blackadder said that your success and he said was to be admired given the fact that you are one of the hardest workers i mean you, you talk you talked about that a little bit early on is that those disciplines you learned growing up i mean 
When you think about the success that you were part of with Canterbury, because it was outstanding. I mean, you guys, I think, what, five five titles in a row? You, you yes. look at that. Um, what was the basis of that success? What separated that group of men apart from the rest of the country? Um, Self-belief was a massive thing. Um, that was just one point it's worth mentioning. As we came together a, a day one of a, a new Canterbury team, you know, we, we set goals and we believed we wanted to win the championship. So we didn't sort of set, uh, we wanted to set lofty goals. Um, success breeds success. So once we, I remember my first year playing for Canterbury, we won 8-7 against a really good Wellington team. They had the All Blacks playing. We also had our All Blacks playing. Um, but after that, we wanted to go back to back. And then once we won two in a row, we wanted to win three in a row. And then as you get a bit of success, that self-belief grows even more and you just get that momentum. So, yeah, we just, um, we spoke about that every day or at least every week um, and, and just really, really believed in ourselves. So you've got that success and that that's that team, but then you become part of a Crusaders side that had so many great players, but it got to a point where it couldn't quite get over the final hurdle. You know, it, it was there or thereabouts. You're in the playoffs, you're in finals. I mean, there, and there were some things that obviously made it incredibly challenging. I'll talk about those in a moment. But what was what was the difference? What was your impression of Super Rugby compared to the National Provincial Championship? It's definitely a step up. You have less uh, time and space. You know, the, as a back, there's, a bit, there's more pressure on you. Um, Perhaps in the ITM Cup, you might have a week or two or the odd game where potentially most of those that team's built of club players and doesn't have too much experience and, and you can have some pretty big victories. Um, in Super Rugby, you know, any team could almost tip you up. So you never wanted to turn up thinking that you, you had the game in the bag because as soon as you did that, you're um, that wasn't the right attitude to have. We all know that. But... Super Rugby has its challenges. It's, you know, you have to travel. Um, don't get me wrong, I love going to South Africa, but it was a really intimidating place, or especially in your first year to play. You learned how to deal with that and, and, and enjoyed that. Um, yeah, you're just, you're just around sort of more world-class athletes, um, international players week in, week out. Um, it's, it was a tough competition. Now, we had, we had some really good players, and, and twice we got to... Or it might have been three finals. I'm just a little bit fuzzy on fuzzy on a few of the stats, but a few of those finals we only lost by one or two points. Now we're, we're so close and really proud of what we achieved those years. But it just came down to a few key moments and games, um, a couple of mistakes potentially, and, and that was the game. So you know, if I reflect a little bit, in 2011 we made the final, um, and we, we lost that game by a couple of points. So a good red side, but potentially we played our final the week before in Cape Town, made a really good win. I didn't actually play that year in the semi or the final, but I played three quarters of that year and I, then I ruptured my pec muscle in the round robin at, against the Stormers in Cape Town. But yeah, so we're really close. It's just sport can uh, be really fine margins as, as we know, especially watching the Olympics. We all know it um, can just sort of hang by a thread from here and there. So that's what it was. 2011 though was a remarkable season for um, tragic circumstances. Uh, what Christchurch and New Zealand and the rugby community had to go through, but also just the, the general community um, in terms of the earthquake. I mean, what, what are your recollections of of that year before your injury and obviously the disappointment of not winning? But, I mean, that was, I mean, that was something that all of us admired about that group. What can you remember of dealing with that challenge? Yes. First of all, like, I had just, it was 1251 the major earthquake um in february and i was just getting out of the shower and then as a rugby park it's a bit of an old concrete jungle and i thought that it was going to collapse um because i never felt something so strong and uh for, had that much force so i just i ran out onto the field with another sort of dozen players and we just gathered on the field now half the team had just sort of left and some were having 
lunch in town or heading heading towards town in their cars yeah it was a bit of i guess a bit of shock um we we all sort of went home and the phones were down so it was quite hard to just ring and check on our partners or families um i got home and there was a bit of damage everything was broken in the house like all the plates my pergola had fallen down um the chimney had fallen down um so yeah there it was a really tough time you know obviously some people it was tragedy a lot of people lost their lives and that you know never want to see that again and, and a lot of people were affected in other ways whether it was their business was closed um things like that we came together as a team and you know there there wasn't a lot we could really do i mean some of us got out and and um you know started helping clean up liquefaction um i actually did that i think the second day after the earthquake my flatmate worked for filton hogan so i jumped in his truck and went around some of the road just putting out cones and just just trying to use our common sense to help um yeah once we sort of knew our immediate families were okay when the team sort of came back together um it was all new so we what we decided is um you know maybe the people from christchurch we sort of got the feeling people from christchurch wanted us to carry on and and then we could inspire them by playing sport to um give the give the people of christchurch and canterbury something to sort of cheer for so we decided we we're going to carry on with the campaign i think we've missed the first game against the hurricanes mm. um and then so we we obviously didn't play any home games in christchurch that year we played in nelson and timaru we even flew halfway around the world to play in twickenham which was a great game that game against the sharks we sort of came up with a few sayings like you know um it's either going to make us or oh this wasn't a saying but we sort of thought it was either going to make us or break us so there's no point now complaining that we have to travel like we don't want to moan or grizzle about it we just have to get on with it and as you know jeff um adversity can bring out the best of you and um so so playing away from home meant that we got to reach out to other provinces and we got a lift from that and potentially it was harder for the other teams because they had to not only just fly to Christchurch, they had to go up to Nelson as well um, or, or down to Timaru. So we just sort of got on with it. And I think we all knew what everyone had been through, particularly the people in Christchurch. So, yeah, it was a shame to lose the final that year because it just sort of capped it off. But I remember flying back with the team the next day and we had so many people at the airport, it was like we had won the World Cup final. And that was pretty humbling just to see all those smiles on everyone's faces even though we'd lost but they were just still there to support us and pretty satisfying um coming back to oh, that support. oh look and, and i know i know the the rugby fraternity were um admired exactly like you say about how you went back to try and inspire and provide entertainment and a distraction from what was an incredibly difficult and challenging time but there are a lot of great times obviously as well with the crusaders in terms of getting moments and opportunities and this is another chance for you four brothers to play together together again but this is at the professional level this is not you know at school that this is at you know where you're going to be tested i mean do you remember the first time you were all on the paddock together yes it was actually a pre-season game against the hurricanes in ikatahuna um, which is just a stone's throw from where we were brought up maybe 40 45 minutes drive um so that was that was pretty cool um in terms of the first professional game outside of that pre-season game it was uh i'm pretty sure it was uh, against the chiefs in, in napier in 2012 well naturally uh there was a bit of you know media that week um I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we were maybe the four first four brothers to play in super rugby certainly all in the same game potentially just can't quite remember if we started that game um or, or there was a, all started together or there was a couple on the bench but i know um it might have been a year later jeff in 2013 yeah. we all started against the stormers in cape town now that that game um certainly has a, has a lot of memories um for myself and my brothers yeah, newlands is a great ground though i mean it, it's something it was something unique i always enjoyed playing there stand straight up and um, we have an element of support the crusaders have huge support um in south africa um based on their success and and i know you would formed a bond there but what was what was memorable about that game in particular yeah 
the start of that year, we lost, lost our two opening games. Uh, and then we won the, had won the two after that. So we went over to South Africa, and that's a challenge, as everyone knows. And the Stormers were the form team. They had a lot of experienced players, South African players. And, and the sort of word was they were going to roll, roll us uh, young, this young Crusaders team. We had a few of our experienced players out, all blacks out. And um, that week, I think uh, Samuel, my brother, went up for a line out. He said, and White Crockett might have been out of position. Um, not that I know too much around line outs, but he, um, White Crockett's tooth went through Sam's uh, hand and had a massive fat lip. Um, Flinney was captain. We had young Tyler Blindale, first five. Um, when the game started, Owen Franks went off injured. Um, so we lost sort of an experienced tight head. And Crocky played the full game at tight head prop. He's, um, the sort of normally plays loose head so yeah. we we um it was it wasn't a we didn't we won but we won tough i think matt todd might have or scored a tyler might have went through a gap passed to sam sam passed to matt toddy went in for the try and and maybe tom marshall might have got a try in that game so it was you know against a big physical south african um team in the stormers we just had to bar up and we barred up physically and you know it was in front of a full pack stadium and, and to get that win gave us a lot of self-belief, especially as uh, a lot of us were still pretty young. Yeah, look, Crocky, I mean, he, he was complaining at the best of times and playing tight head prop, let's be honest. I mean, he's, he, was, he, never, he never enjoyed that. He never enjoyed that. Um, look, at the end of 2004, let's move to 2014 because you get an opportunity to be part of the Sevens campaign. And it, it, I love talking to people who had an opportunity to play for Titch. Because yeah. everyone's experiences are a little bit different. But he obviously was impressed by your engine, the fact you could go, because we know that was a huge, huge part of what Sevens was about, and, and particularly in his regime. What did you, how did you find playing in a couple of tournaments under, under Titch? Oh, I absolutely loved it. Um, to wear the black jersey, um, all black Sevens jersey, was, was a proud moment for myself. Um, we, we won the two tournaments that we're in, in Glasgow and in London, which meant we won the World Series title that year. I was fortunate to play on a really good team. We had a lot of experienced players. Um, and uh, But to play under touch, it was pretty inspiring. Um, I think, you know, I went up to the camp and I, I wasn't too sure. Um, I got invited up there, so I was like, yeah, I'm going to go. Because I wasn't playing that much for the Crusaders that year. I was sort of playing a bit of club rugby or on the bench a bit. So... They said, yeah, you got, got up to the sevens camp and um, I won the fitness test. Uh, so I think Titch had a lot of respect once I um, once I won that. But uh, yeah, played reasonably okay in the trials and then was lucky enough to get selected. So to go over and win a couple of tournaments was special. And, you know, sevens is a whole different game because there's only, you know, seven plus, you say, five reserves. There might be 12 in your squad um, and you get really tight. Um and, and doing things like, um, you know, doing a little blowout the, the morning of the Sevens tournament, um, things like that were, you know, because so, Titch liked us having a bit of a sweat up before we even got to the ground, so you got your second wind. Yep. Just doing a few of those sort of things were quite interesting. I think everyone had their second wind with Titch all the time, right? <laughs> that was just the way it worked. That's how it operated. That, yeah. that was his, his mantra, but he had great success doing it, and you, and you can never argue with that. So... So what happened next then in terms of you and your future as a rugby player? Yeah, um, I, I didn't make the Commonwealth Games team for the sevens. I was sort of a non-travelling reserve. Um, and then, yeah, just I was, I was about 27 at that stage and I got a few opportunities to go to France and I wasn't playing that much for the Crusaders that year. Um, so I thought maybe it's a time to go, go overseas. And yeah, I... I got an opportunity halfway through the at the end of the Canterbury rugby season to go over and play in France. So I went over in November. We got engaged six weeks before we went to my wife Tiffany, um, and and we went to France on this big adventure. And we played we played for Bayonne in the top fourteen for and the Pro D do for for about yeah four seasons. Um, yeah, it was a great experience. I can I can speak French now. We travelled around France. Um, I really liked the food, the architecture, meeting the French people. It was awesome. We lived in one of the best places in France, in Beirut, and, and I played just down the road, 20 minutes down the road from for Bayonne, and Spain was just 20 minutes 
oh, probably 30 minutes down the road. Um, yeah, it was, there's a whole other subject playing rugby in France. Um, yeah, way different, um, but, but, a, but a great experience. Was it hard though? We, we, did you feel as though you were giving up a, a maybe an all black dream? If it, was that still a dream at, up until that point or had you had that realization that maybe it wasn't going to be there for you? Yeah. Um, I know I wasn't an all black, um, which my three brothers were and it was a proud moment of me playing for the all black sevens. Um, I, I felt like I played a lot of my rugby for super rugby towards, especially towards the end of it on the wing. Um, and I, I preferred my preferred position was center then probably second five. And then, then the wing, I would play anywhere just to play or be part of the 22 that, that team that um, week. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm proud of my career and that, but I, I probably still had a bit of work to do to, to reach or a lot of work to do to ever make the all blacks. Um, certainly, but, um, yeah, to, to play to wear the black fur, the black fern and represent the sevens. I felt I was a prop mainly in sevens, where I just had to work hard, make tackles, support, try to be, you know, just empty the tank every game. I felt like that role sort of suited me um, to the way I sort of tried to play the game. So yeah, uh, disappointed never made the All Blacks, but still proud of my career and and really proud. Well, it was awesome to go to France to, to experience what I experienced over there at the same time. Because, I, I mean, I ask that question because I look at it and go, I'd love to, most players would love to have your career. I mean, this is the reality that there's so many few players that make it. I mean, there are so many few that get to that, that highest level. But the experiences you've had, if you look back at this, the career of, you know, of, of playing with your brothers at the highest level in terms of professionalism around Super Rugby, playing for Canterbury and winning titles, you've got every right to be proud of that career. Absolutely. You know, so that yes. shift to me and that, that experience. And do you think now for players that is just as important as getting that experience like you had in France, that in an adventure where you go, you know what, it, it, it sometimes is a little bit more than just getting maybe one or two opportunities at the very top? Yeah, I, th I think it is a saying, you know, it's every young boys dream and, and girl to play for the all blacks or the, the black ferns um i think you know don't ever give up on that dream and you know you can you know if, if you get a bit older and you haven't made that team well keep going because you know a lot can happen in 12 months and a lot can happen in one game and everyone remembers your last game and you know if you're having an average season and you go and you work really hard in the off season and you, you train smart well you can come back and have an awesome season and there might be one or two injuries with players in front of you and then you get the opportunity. So I think it's just show a bit of resilience and not go too too early, in my opinion, um, because New Zealand rugby can set your... If you have a good base in New Zealand, it can set you up to have a very long career in New Zealand or overseas. So because we've got the best coaches and support structures. Um, so I believe, you know, stay in New Zealand to play your best rugby, but then certainly don't... When the time's right, and you'll probably know when the time's right um, to go overseas, but don't don't go at the first opportunity if, if that makes sense. Because you know a lot of things can happen for you if you just show some resilience and perseverance. And and that's probably me speaking from my heart. By you know I, I, I kept really fit in the off season, and then Titch sort of heard that I went to a sevens camp, and then I did well in the fitness test. I did well in the trial. So then I made New Zealand sevens team. So things like that can happen. And yeah, like. I'm, I'm proud to sort of have my plaque up on the wall to play over 100 games for Canterbury and the Crusaders. Um, and all four of my brothers have that that up there on, on the wall. So certainly, um, yeah, you don't don't forget where, where you came from. In some, ways, where, yeah. in some ways, the story you're talking about is what Luke went through, right? Where that, he showed that resilience and he hung in there and he got a taste of it and then the decision was it was time maybe, you know, um, the yes. door was going to close and, and make the most of it. You know, players... There are so many players that have to go through that and, and forge their own path. Oh, 100%. Um, I think so. It makes you better players. And if it was easy, anyone would would be given it. Or you'd, But it's not easy, so you have to work hard. It's um, Sometimes, you know, you look out what the game can give you, but you've got to sort of work on yourself and, and, and figure out what you've got to do as well. Um, so, yeah, you just got to just got to keep, keep working hard, I think. Um, through all of that, as professionals, as four brothers, did you get 
as as you play more and more together and train more and more together every day, did you get closer as brothers? Yeah. No, we're, we're each oh. other's. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I Yeah, we, we know everyone's pain points. Um, and, uh, <laughs> you know, every, we've all got nicknames for each brother and some I might not be able to say on here, but no, it's all well that like yeah. it. But um, certainly we, look, we're all our own men, but we, we're all each other's best mates as well. So, um we, we, we talk a lot to, together, um, but we would come to training, we'd, we'd train and have, we'd catch up. Um, but after training, you know, we'd go do our own things. But in saying that, we would quite often have sort of brother dinners here and there or quite often would sort of catch up with your brothers more, I guess, um, when you went hunting. So if I went with George on a Sunday hunting for six or seven, eight hours, you know, have a good catch up with him then. So quite often yeah. when you're training, you know, I'm with the backs doing the weights and George is out, you know, doing line out session. We come in, we've got a team meeting, the training, work on media. And, and then as soon as you finish, you know, you, if you've got a promo, or you're looking to get home and have lunch or, or, um, so yeah, there wasn't that much time to sort of just catch up during the training day, but certainly in the weekends or, um, outside of the rugby, we, we caught up here and there. And so, what is it now for the for the four brothers? What are, what are, what are the catch up points? Yeah, um, well, like um, with modern technology, it's, it's easy to stay in touch. You know, we've got the the WhatsApp or the Viber group chats. Um, so quite often, you know, you, you might just put a photo on there, what you've been up to, and a, and a photo can say a thousand words. Um, quite often, oh, every now and then, we might have a call with all four of us, and um, once you get through the uh, the banter and a, a bit of bullshit, it's uh, might just sort of briefly catch up what everyone's been up to, but um, yeah, look, we're, we're all like we're all married now, and, and there's uh, I've got two young children, and George has got two young children, and Sam and Hannah have just had their third, and Luke and third child, and Luke and Claire are married, so we're all sort of got our own families now, and, and at that next stage, and I tell you what, it's not just us four brothers catching up. Um, you know, it might be once a year, Jeff, with everyone's busy schedules, we might be able to catch up. Um, but it's but it's normally with the wives and the kids and seven kids running around. It's uh, it's yeah. pretty mayhem. So um, enough that, to fill a seven I, I, at least. So hold on. So is that where is that where mum and dad really come in? And is this where you're thinking is Christmas is Christmas at home back on the family farm, or have they said no, 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 no? We'll just we'll spread it out a bit across the year. Yeah, yeah. Well, every second year we tend to make sure we, we get home because the alternative year that we might be with our wives, families. But our certain, last year we were all at home, minus Luke and Claire, because they were in France. So it was a bit yeah. hard for them to come. But we had our six six grandkids there, or six of our children, and um, and mum and dad uh, were there as well. And it was pretty diabolical. So mum and dad took them down to the beach and um, we... They, uh, we built a hut together and just to sort of wear them out a wee bit and then we come back and have lunch and a bit of quiet time and then it sort of uh, all erupts as it's sort of dinner time and bath time and story time before we go to yeah. bed. So um, it's all it's all good fun. Um, there's uh, never a dull moment. And, uh, yeah, I sort of take my hat off to mum and dad reflecting now once of uh, since I'm a father. You know, they had four under five on a farm and, you know, getting four of us into the car, um, getting enough food for four of us. Mum used to say when they used to go out for dinner, not that they went out much with young kids, but we'd go to McDonald's and they'd just order straight o- straight away because they said, if, if, bring it out as fast as you can, otherwise <laughs> these kids are going to wreck the place. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, busy busy times. So so when you, when you hung it up, did you know? I asked the same question to everyone because everyone's story sometimes is a little bit different. Did you know when it was time? And when it was time, what did it mean for you for life after rugby? Yeah, so I've been finished now for three years, Jeff. Um, been two years at ANZ Bank and I did a year dairy farming after I finished. But look, I to be honest, I really miss really, really miss playing when I when I finished. Um, probably because I knew physically I could still um, I still had more in me. Um, I was only thirty. Um, I think I think you might have finished in your late twenties. Um, I read somewhere, Jeff, but um, yeah, to me, like, it's probably probably one of the worst or the harder things about playing sport was injuries. Um, now, I've had many injuries and you strap them up and carry on and 
a few you've had surgery, but you know, I had a few bad concussions throughout my career and I recovered. Each one just sort of took me a bit longer to recover. Um, and certainly the last one, it probably took a year. So that was probably the final straw um, to me just hanging, hanging out the boots. And it took, took a while for me to accept that, to be honest. Um, and, but that, that's why now I, um, I try to keep really fit and healthy. So I set myself challenges. I'm going to do the Kepler at the end of the year, 60 Ks. Last year, I, I thought, oh, well, what's going to be a really tough challenge? So I ran 100 Ks in a day. Um, now what? I ran 70 Ks um, without stopping, and I had to fast walk the last 30 Ks um, just because I so, got really sore in one of my ankles. But yeah, so I do a few things like that. So I'm, I'm picking there's no sprint for the last 200 meters. You're not getting into that point where you're going from the, from the old family house to the, or is it, I've, I've just got to get to the end. I mean, this is, I mean, that's remarkable. What, I mean, is that, does that tell you something about yourself though? We talk about self-awareness a lot just before we go. Self-awareness a lot in terms of the game of rugby union. I mean, is that for you, you know, you need that. That's, yeah. that's the driver behind it. That, that I suppose gives you some of the greatest satisfaction. Oh, 100%. Like, you've got to – I don't want to blow out once I finish rugby in it. And I think it's just having the goal to work towards something, something that's physically challenging that, you know, you potentially could fail in it or set yourself up to failure. But, you know, I want to do the coast to coast um, and a few things like that in the next few years. But you're running my first marathon two years ago in Queenstown. It was really satisfying. Running that 100K in a year last year was was cool. Um, you yeah, want to do a few other triathlons and things, but – it just gives you a focus going forward. And a few people might say that's a wee bit, wee bit crazy, but, you know, um, I still like to be an athlete and, and like keeping fit. And, it, and it's the people that I meet and run with as well. And now I'm in a corporate role. I've got to keep fit and healthy because it just gives me more energy when I'm sitting in front of a computer. Um, I do get out and see a few farmers being a rural banker at ANZ. But, yeah, when I finished that 100K, I don't think I was sprinting the last 200 metres on that one, Jeff. So there's... Um, <laughs> Sam actually came down for the last five or six k that day, um, and just sort of uh, supported me to to get through. So um, yeah, the uh, thing. Do you see in any world Sam doing anything like that when he's finished playing? Given the fact he is still going and yeah. remarkably, <laughs> remarkably playing some of his best rugby. Um, yeah, you've got to take some of the credit for that, surely. <laughs> nah, no. Nah, well, Sam's uh Sam's had an awesome career and is an awesome player. I mean, I'm probably a bit biased because I'm his brother, but I mean, <laughs> Sam never gets injured. He's, he's pretty resilient. Um, touch wood, um, he doesn't get injured. But yeah, Sam, um, you know, he he did did do a wee lockdown challenge last year after they came back from Australia. He biked the length of New Zealand um, each day. So he did 14 days in quarantine and, and I think he biked 1,500 kilometres, which, which is not a lot probably by a biker's standard, but it was just a little challenge to do. The season, rugby season was over and, and just sort of um, stop a bit of boredom. But, yeah, so whether it's that or big hunting trips, um, it's always good to have little goals or, or little challenges or interests. Mate, I, look, I've, I've really enjoyed this chat and, and hearing the background and hearing the stories about, I, I think it's a remarkable achievement, the four of you playing together at, at – at one of the highest levels in terms of the game um, and, and super rugby, but for Canterbury and mate, you should be incredibly proud of your pr- career and what you've had um, and, and proud of what, uh, proud of what your family has achieved. And uh, look, it's been, it's been great to catch up. Thanks for joining us here on, uh, on sports um, sky sports playmakers. Thanks a lot, Jeff. Um, yeah. Happy to tell a few stories and yeah, very, really, really appreciative of everyone who's helped me over my career and, and especially family and, and all the coaches, too many to name. But uh, yeah, great, great chatting. And hopefully, uh, hopefully that gives a wee bit of insight into myself and, and my, my family, and especially my brothers. So yeah, cheers. Cheers.